Nothing's better than fresh fruit from the garden. I just can't say that enough. This particular plant will actually shoot up additional leaf tissue. The program was to create food for the public. They are public orchards. It's a lot of work, but it really is worth it when you see all these blooms and it's gorgeous. Hello and welcome to Great Gardening. I'm Dennis Lamkin, the new host for the 2022 gardening season. We have our garden experts with us uh, tonight. They are horticulturalist and educator Bob Olin and garden professional Deb Burns Erickson. As always, we want to hear from gardeners across the region who have questions for our experts. Volunteers from the St. Louis County Master Gardeners Program are here to answer the phones. Call locally or toll free 218-788-2844 or toll free 1-877-307-8762 or you can email us at askwdse.org. I'd uh, now like to take a moment to introduce myself. I'm Dennis Lamkin and I am an, an avid uh, gardener, uh, more of a landscaper I'd honestly say than a, than a gardener and uh, have been interested in this um, uh, business for about 45 years. I live on the corner of 21st Avenue East and 1st Street, so if you drive by, uh, take a look. On the, uh, on the upper corner, we have a Xeriscape garden that reflects Lake Superior with the waves uh, coming into it. And the, on the lower side, uh, we have a formal garden. And uh, very proud of that, so stop by and take a look at it. Um, talk about current conditions, Bob. Yeah. Well, first mm -hmm. we want to welcome you. Yes, well, thank welcome. you. And we you. admire your landscaping abilities. <laughs> mm -hmm. Zero scaping. Uh, were you thinking of low moisture potentially? Low moisture and, and maintenance? ease of maintenance. Yeah, right. yeah absolutely. And nice. I think those are one of the themes we're going to have going forward. So you're just a little ahead of the curve there. So <laughs> mm -hmm. that's great. Hopefully so. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. The current conditions. Oof. It's spring, Bob. Yeah. Spring. No. Welcome you know. on this lovely yeah. snowy evening as we're recording this, and here we got it. We are very optimistic that it will change shortly. <laughs> what usually happens, Dennis, is you know, you know, we get these very, very uh, long winters, uh, very, very late spring like this, and then suddenly it all bursts. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it's going to it's going to be here. I'm confident of that. Slow release rain. That's yeah. right. Uh, we will answer your question shortly, but first, we visited the headquarters of the Duluth Community Garden Program, where they shared with us details about their vegetable of the year. My name is Haley Diem and I'm the One Vegetable, One Community Coordinator with the Duluth Community Garden Program. The Duluth Community Garden Program manages 21 gardens across the Duluth area. So the One Vegetable, One Community Program is all about getting excited and celebrating a vegetable of the year. And part of my job as the One Vegetable, One Community Coordinator is to educate the public about the vegetable of the year. The vegetable of the year this year is tomatoes. We have a really short growing season here in Duluth. Tomatoes weren't really a clear choice for Duluth. Um, it's cold, they're a heat loving crop, so it is a little bit out of our normal realm. The reason why I love tomatoes as this year's selection is that there's so many different things to teach the public about tomatoes. You can can them, you can dry them. There's so many different ways that you can eat tomatoes in the winter. A lot of people like to have arguments about whether or not the tomato is a vegetable. There was a Supreme Court case in the 1800s that deemed tomatoes as a vegetable. Someone was trying to evade taxes. He was trying to evade a vegetable tax and they ruled it a vegetable. Tomatoes are a member of the nightshade family. So they are technically, botanically a fruit. There's also so many different varieties of tomatoes. They come in all different colors, especially for teaching younger children about the variety and diversity in vegetables. They're a really great choice because they can be any size and any color. Bob, you wanted to share some information about tomatoes. Well, I appreciated that video and, and Haley's comment. We'll have our own little discussion mm -hmm. about fruit or vegetable. Um, it is certainly the number one vegetable crop, and you find that to be the case as well. I think it's one of the most popular and people want to try it and they're going to have success with it. And there's so many choices for varieties and size and you will have success with it. 
variability. The irony is, like so many things, things change. There was a lot of misinformation. It was considered to be uh, poisonous for a long time, <laughs> actually, and now it went from that to being the number one vegetable uh, probably in the world. There are over 10,000 different varieties. You know, Deb, I opened my catalogs and I could find 1,500 varieties right in front of me. So you gotta, you're going to make some choices. Mm -hmm. You're going to look for some short season because we do have a shorter season compared to the rest of the world. But one of the nice things about the new hybrids is we can still get some tremendous, uh, tremendous production. I don't think that people realize that tomato is actually a perennial. It would keep right on growing, except it's a tender perennial, so the frost freezes it off. So some, that's something that I think is just, just a little bit unique about it. We have basically three types. We've got determinants. As the name implies, they grow to about three or four feet. They stop, they set fruit. And then we got indeterminates, which are going to give you more of the yield, but they're a little harder to manage. They continue to grow. And then we got something in between. Uh, they call them uh, compact determinates. I think they didn't know where to put a couple of these oddballs, so they created the oddball category, the compact uh, determinates as a result. But uh, they're very unique. Uh, we're pushing hard for pollinators, pollinator gardens. Uh, we really want to do what we can to improve the habitat for our pollinating insects, which are so important to so many vegetables as well as fruits, but not necessarily in the case of tomatoes. That's one of the real ironies. Uh, tomatoes have got a, uh, a very unique structure. They are a complete flower and they're buzz pollinated. So some of the insects just trying to get at the blossom will shake the blossom. So if you want to enhance pollination, you just give it a little flick. You don't need electric toothbrush. You don't need any of that. Just give that blossom a little bit of a, of a flick. And uh, that will actually uh, help with the pollination process. We set a new record in Minnesota last year. We uh, grew the largest tomato, or I should say Chris Brown did, out of Now Then. Know where Now Then is, uh, Deb? <laughs> yes, yeah, well, barely. Barely. Barely know where it is. That's because right. Now Then is barely a town, but mm -hmm. it's just north of Anoka, and I happened to be through there. Had a friend from there, and it kind of went by pretty fast, the window. But uh, Chris Brown grew this beautiful compound beef steak over nine pounds. And that was a record that was just set uh, last year. So is it a fruit or is it a vegetable? Maybe we can talk about that. There was a Supreme Court's case, and who knows what, uh, that was a case of commerce. I think in the general vernacular, it is a vegetable. But technically, and those of us trained in the profession, um, it's definitely a fruit. Because we define fruit as uh, this ripened ovary wall. So mm -hmm. any vegetable that contains seed and has that Inside. thickened over, mm -hmm. over, ovary wall I is technically a fruit. So if we take a look at one of these, and I, this is one of those stores balls. I was worried about Nothing. spilling uh, juice all over the table, but as you can see, uh, not a lot of juice in some of these. We're going to do much better, mm -hmm. much, much better in this with our own tomatoes. Any homegrown tomato is better. But you can see here we've got this thickened ovary wall. Any time that you've got seeds formed, now these were formed when we. Uh, the pollen was transferred, the pollen tube grew, and then we fertilize these seeds. Once these seeds are fertilized, then the ovary wall begins to thicken and begins to ripen. That's really what we're consuming. So this is a fruit, just as in the case of cucumbers, fruit or vegetable, Deb? Fruit. Absolutely fruit, mm -hmm. because you got that thickened ovary wall. So botanically, definitely is a fruit, and uh, a favorite fruit for all of our uh, northern gardeners, as well as southern gardeners, just mm -hmm. about everybody. If we could just take a little look, and I want to thank Kathy Stengel that did this diagram for me. I wanted to illustrate this on the, um, on the blossom, the flower blossom. Again, they're complete, and this is the reason why gravity, wind, flicking, and agitation from some of the insects. But the pollen, we've really got a pollen tube that runs right down through the center of that blossom. We've got the male portion, the anthers, just around the, the female portion, and all it takes is transfer onto that pollen tube, but what's really significant, the pollen has to grow down through that tube, has to get all the way down into these premature uh, seeds, and has to fertilize the seeds. So one of the difficulties we have with our cooler climate is that pollen tube will stop growing if the nighttime temperatures go below 55 degrees. So we all know that uh, that's fairly common in June, and consequently the pollen tube stops once fertilization doesn't occur, the blossom falls off or it aborts. I had an interesting experience. I did a little work with uh, some a breeder down in Homestead, Florida, where they were looking for varieties that would set fruit under extremely hot conditions. And what they had was aggressive pollen. We found a variety called Heat Wave that was actually grown in Florida, 
but because it had aggressive pollen, it fertilized that egg, it worked well for us here in northern Minnesota as well. Thanks, Bob. Thanks. Uh, we're getting some questions in here. Uh, Lily from Duluth, what are good choices to uh, start for seeds for tomatoes? Oh, boy, we could have a discussion on this <laughs> oh, 10,000, yeah. couldn't we? Yes. You want to start with a couple of your well, favorites? Well, I, I do like to choose some of the All-American selections because yes. they are proven, they are tested. Um, there's a lot of good ones. Celebrity, Celebrity. is a really good tomato. Um, it's determinant, so it'll set its fruit. Um, and then I like Champion. To me, Champion's a tomato that you can make a sandwich out of. It's not... Uh, it's nice and meaty, um, but and there's so many cherry tomatoes, every size of fruit available, and every so d determine what you're going, what you like to do with your tomato. That's, That's the first true. question I always ask. What do you want to do with it? Do you want to can it? Do you want to dry it? Do you want to just have it for salads, or do you want to? Are you a tomato sandwich kind of person? I'm a tomato sandwich kind of girl. Yeah, I love those. We talked about the beef, the beef steaks, and I think we've got a couple of big beef. Uh, Big Nina, if you've grown that one, a, a mm -hmm. real nice beef steak. And um, you mentioned some of the cherries. I think a couple have been extremely popular. Mm -hmm. Sun Gold and Sun mm -hmm. Sugar. These mm -hmm. are the tangerine cherries, very, very sweet. Sun Gold and Sun Sugar. And of the two, Sun Gold came out originally, but it tends to crack on us. I found that Sun Sugar, if, mm -hmm. and they're both available uh, locally and in seed catalogs, has a little tougher skin on it and will hold on the plant a little bit longer. But she should really look at the days. Mm -hmm. How many days to maturity? That's the number one right. thing that she should look at because it doesn't matter how good the tomato is. If you don't get a tomato, it doesn't matter. What yeah, do we expect right. our growing season? How many days do we anticipate around here? Well, if you can keep it under 70, in my opinion, mm -hmm. you're going to have a, a prolific Better year. Better chance of success. Yeah. Mike would like to know, uh, would you eat the stem of a tomato plant? The tomato plants in the Solanaceae family, and one reason it's got its reputation for being uh, poisonous is uh, that also includes the deadly nightshade. Uh, we never want to consume any portion of the vegetative part of the plant. And it's not going to be real serious, but they do contain some of these uh, materials that tend to be poisonous. So, um, same thing with potatoes. There's nothing wrong with the potato, but we would really rather not consume any of the green portion of the plant. Okay. And, and you can tell sometimes um, when you walk through, if you get a slight allergic reaction to them too, you can. I mean, they can just mm -hmm. yeah. almost start to close your throat in a, in a big tomato. True, but area. for most people, the fruit we never we never nope. really worry about. Sometimes no, but the plant, the, yeah. the plant okay. itself. Stay away from that. Interesting. Mm -hmm. um, the acidity of pine needles, if added to the soil, is it a good idea for mulching tomatoes or not? This is an urban rural myth, one way or another. Um, Pine needles are pure carbon, they're cellulose, they don't impact the pH one bit. I think where that came from was uh, we tend to have acidic soils where pine trees are growing. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. the, the acidity was in the soil, the pine needles really didn't acidify the soil. Mm -hmm. So they make a great mulch on top, they're neutral, they'll hold moisture, which is going to mm -hmm. be important this year. But if you want to acidify your soil, you're going to look at acid sphagnum peat moss, you're going to look at some kind of a sulfur bearing compound for acidification not for pine needles. Okay. Deb, you wanted to talk a little bit about uh, rooting tomatoes from, from cuttings. Right, which you can, you can root, like if your tomatoes are starting to get leggy, like this one, if it has, if they've been grown too close together or you were a little overzealous and you seeded them heavy, um, they might start to get a little um, tall, a little lean, and you can just take the top, um, node out and you can actually root this once you cut it. You could root it in water. You can also root it um, right directly into the soil um, and that will really help your tomato uh, get thicker, get heavier and all the nodes behind the lead node will then um, have the suckers but then those will become your lead and then um, if you're doing indeterminate tomatoes then you could, are determinate sorry, determinate ones, then you could um, start another one from this one and then you're going to have a, um, you'll be able to stage your tomatoes to set them apart and so you'll have fruiting on the first one and then later fruiting on the second one. But also when planting them, if you take a long kind of stringy tomato and you can either plant it deep and just leave that top tip out mm -hmm. and you can cover it all up, that becomes root hairs. You can take off the lateral branches. You don't have to, we don't always do it. Um, but you can, um, and then if you're putting it into a container, make sure you water all the way through, 
so that the water comes out the bottom. Because the roots are at the bottom, you have to get water to the bottom. Or you could lay it down when you're transplanting it into the ground. And all you've got to do is set up that top tip and then lay the rest in. And I, I prefer this way because the ground is warmer and they um, can get the water easily. And um, tomatoes really do want warm ground. They don't really want to go in too deep where it's a lot colder. For us up in the north, it's, it's a challenge and you can really stunt the root growth if it's in the cold ground. Yeah, you may not want to push the season with right. tomatoes. They're warm season crops. You're not going to be, uh, you're not going to benefit from setting out early, even if it doesn't freeze. It just sets them back and they harden off on you. So if you look at, uh, we always said June 10th and people said that was too late last year or the year before last, we froze on June 11th. I mm -hmm. found that mm -hmm. from my own personal experience, had to do a lot of replanting. So even though, you know, our season is uh, technically it is getting a little longer. But we don't know when we're going to get that early freeze. Will it be on the, in the spring or will it be in the fall? Even if we're getting another day or two, we really have to watch the forecast and err on the side mm -hmm. of safety with this crop. Mm -hmm. I like your, you know, your discussion there of burying them deep. Mm -hmm. One thing we've, we've found consistently is consistent moisture. And I'm going back to this moisture theme because we're expecting a warmer mm -hmm. year. Consistency of moisture. One of the problems with tom tomatoes is blossom end rot. And that's a, a calcium transfer problem where we, we actually can have calcium in the soil. Sometimes we don't have it in the mixes, but try to water consistently. So not once every three or four or five days if it's real dry, but perhaps daily in a container and uh, hang out. Oh, for sure, for mm -hmm. sure in a container daily. Um, uh, Tom asks, what about grafting tomatoes? Oh, boy. <laughs> 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 I wonder if Tom's given that one a try. <laughs> if, you think a grafting, if you think grafting apples is difficult, grafting has become a relatively commonplace in mm -hmm. the commercial industry. So you'll graft a top stock, again, for the quality of the tomato, and then you'll graft onto a root stock for typically vigor or disease resistance. Mm -hmm. But it's pretty delicate, you know, and uh, I've tried it once. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. Let the professionals, I know of commercial people either in northern Minnesota that are believers in it, but they actually buy in grafted plants after they've tried it because it is uh, is kind of fussy. You've got to line up that, that thin cambium layer mm -hmm. and uh, your success rate, it takes quite a bit of expertise, mm -hmm. but it actually is a technique that's gaining and has gained widespread use among commercial producers. Fascinating. Uh, JD from Mattawa, he has started seed indoors. He wants to move them outside to his greenhouse tonight. Hmm. Hmm. Cover the plants with frost cloth. Is this a good idea? Okay, where is the greenhouse? I mean, is it close to the house? You know, he how much heat tell can us you, if it's you know, got heat or does it have heat? Does yeah. it have power? Yeah. You, I mean, you're going to have to have a heat source mm -hmm. um, no matter what because we're going to get frost, it's going. So when you add that layer of poly, you're adding a zone, but one zone farther south is not going to, you know, be able to be out there on its own. And the frost blankets, don't fool yourself. If you've got a high tunnel or you've got poly, you're thinking you're getting a lot of protection, you're really not. And uh, I would say that uh, acclimation's a big thing as mm -hmm. well. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't move them out tonight. Give yourself a couple more days. We're a couple days away from these temperatures really moderating. Mm -hmm. Okay. And if he's using that frost blanket, get it on earlier than later. A lot yeah. of people think, oh, it's about to frost, I'm going to cover. Right. They need to hold the heat with exactly. that blanket. So get it on earlier than later. Very good point. Uh, from JD, will city water affect plants? Oh, there we go. Mm -hmm. His plants mm -hmm. are well. seem to be dying. Oh. oh. That probably won't occur. Wait, now, are we talking about seedlings and in a well, um, we don't know. in a mix that has fertilizer in it? Then it could be the fertilizer in the mix and not a seed starting mix. Yeah, because you're going to get some burn if it's seedlings if mm he's -hmm. starting. But right. depending but on what plants, what plants, and whether it's a seedling, and the biggest rub on uh, municipal water systems is virtually all of them are have fluoride in them or chlorine, and fluoride in particular can cause some, some burning that occurs. Uh, if there's any concern, take that water and just let it sit at, uh, you know, with an open container for 24 hours, and then both of these, uh, chlorine and fluoride, both gasify and leave, leave the water so you won't have a problem. You make a good point. Sometimes 
Uh, house plants are immune to this, but seedlings are very, very tender, mm -hmm. and they could be sensitive to both to fluoride a salt buildup for sure. Yeah. On so those. if he leaves his water sit out and aerate, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. he sure. should be okay. Right, sure. unless it is the seed or the soil yeah. mix. Okay. Mm -hmm. Uh, Charles from Pike Lake. He has two apple trees, a Harrelson and a State Fair. They only produce every other year. How can he get them produ to produce every year? <laughs> They're old trees. <laughs> yeah. They're old trees. Yeah. Well, he's got this, you know, he also has, first he's got two pretty good varieties. Mm -hmm, he does, mm -hmm. yes. I mean, Harrelson, they said that Great. was, when Honeycrisp came along, they said Harrelson, which was the University of Minnesota introduction in the 30s. Still a great apple, really hardy. State Fair comes a lot earlier, different kind of apple. But it's this alternate bearing habit where you'll have lots of heavy fruit production one year, mm -hmm. and then um, because of the flower bud set in the fall, there isn't enough energy left to really set up for the next year. So the way he eliminates it on those real heavy fruit years, pull uh, pulls fruit. some of the fruit off. And you know what I found? I did a little work on this one too. You want to count out 20 leaves, and you only want one fruit for 20 leaves. That's and hard. People are not going to do that. Bob. Well, I'm not for the whole now. tree. <laughs> 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 Unless you got more time than more time than you yeah, and I do. Yeah. But if you count twenty leaves, what you'll find is approximately how many fruit that tree can support. Then there's one fruit. It develops, and you still have enough energy left over so they can set flower buds in the fall, and that will even your mm -hmm. crop out. Commercially, in the heavy years, they use chemicals to drop. Oh yeah drop that fruit mm -hmm. just yep. to moderate it. Yeah, Bort, just, just not all the fruit, but a portion of it. Mm -hmm. So found that uh, count out 20 leaves once and that'll give you an idea how much <laughs> fruit you have to drop. Interesting. Uh, from uh, online, a uh, uh, viewer asks, can they use dill seed from the spice rack to propagate drill, dill? Oh, absolutely, you can. I, okay, so if you buy a seed packet of say dill or fennel or coriander and we've done all these because there have been times when I just needed a few and you can take them out and you can seed them if you buy a seed packet you're looking at 80 to 90 percent uh, germination if you're using depends on how old that uh, spices too. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you're getting fresh spice and you're going to the store and you're buying a more expensive one, you probably have better viability and, and some better germination. But you're looking at, you know, 25 to 30 percent. But if you only need a few and you have a lot of that seed available, then it will work. It, it will germinate as it you It will say. germinate, yeah. I will make one comment though. That those varieties have been selected for the seed. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. if you're going to grow mm -hmm. dill because you want dill heads for your dilly beans or for your dill mm -hmm. pickles, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. then I, dill seed isn't very expensive. Mm -hmm. And so many of our good varieties, bouquet and ducat, mm -hmm. are really designed for that nice head. Correct. Yeah. So I really think that you're mm -hmm. better off uh, buying the actual seed right. uh, for that purpose. Okay. This is a ringer question for you, Bob. No, Fiona bad. wants to know. What kind of tomato do you have in front of you? <laughs> oh, this is great. You this is great. This? Okay, okay. So I want to discuss this just you for a ahead. second. Yeah. So I went and bought tomatoes on my way in today. And this says beef steak tomatoes. This size tomato is not a beef, beef steak tomato. This little thing is more of a slicer. It's more of the celebrity champion size. A beef steak should be twice as big, should be a pound. So th these are smaller, medium fruit um, tomatoes that you'll get more of, not quite as many as a beef steak, but a beef steak's a lot bigger one. And this yeah. one, this was grown, in, produced in Minnesota, but grown in a greenhouse setting. And I happen to know the grower, and he's not telling me what kind of variety. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> uh, and I'm a friend. Yeah. <laughs> I can guess pretty much. It's one yeah. of the BHN varieties, but nonetheless, okay. uh, so I can't honestly tell right. you what we've got. Bob, you wanted to mention a couple of events for our community mm -hmm. calendar? Yeah, real quickly. We're, we are going to talk tomatoes. we got a, a program coming up at Mount Iron through the Extension Office in Virginia. If you want to call 218-749-7120. We're going to talk about uh, growing green in a changing climate and focusing on some of the warm season crops, the peppers and the tomatoes. We're going to walk through that whole process as well as resilience and what you can do to adjust to, it, to this warming climate that we really have. Then we've got our spring gardening extravaganza. Very excited because we're coming together again. We tried to do these things virtually the last couple of years. Mm -hmm. it's, it's not the same. 
That'll be on April 23rd down at the depot, a full day. It's going to go actually from 9 to, to 2. We are going to be uh, looking at sunflowers. Incidentally, both programs, in honor of the Ukrainians doing what we can, we're going to be distributing sunflower seed, different varieties. And I just would like to make the comment, if you're going to be growing sunflowers in our community, look for those varieties that produce pollen. The new ones don't, including this newer variety, <laughs> which of course is a fake, but uh, yeah, I guarantee you this one's pollen free. Mm -hmm. But uh, the newer hybrids don't have any pollen, and so you want to look for the, the, older, uh, the older varieties, the, um, uh, you know, some of the giant mammoths and so forth that are the out there. The cheaper seeds. Yeah, the newer, the nice new, newer poll pollen free are much more expensive These seeds. These branch varieties are very expensive <laughs> and they're pollen free <laughs> and you want pollen for your pollinators. Yep. Okay. Um, well, thank you for tuning in uh, to Great Gardening. Uh, if you missed anything, you can uh, follow us on Instagram at greatgardening.wdse. Subscribe to us on YouTube uh, dot com slash great gardening and like us uh, on WDSE, WKRP, WRPT on Facebook. If you missed any part of the show, it's going to be posted tomorrow on uh, our YouTube channel and on our PBS app. Um, thank you, uh, Bob and Deb. Two are great tonight. Uh, thanks for welcoming me. We have some questions left over. We'll carry them to next week. Thank you. Thank and, you. And Welcome. And yeah. Oh, uh, <laughs> we'll be back next week. And from all of us here, thank you and enjoy the garden.